Hello class, uh, today we'll be talking about uh, vertical fragmentation and allocation, which is part of our previous uh, class on distributed database design. Uh, last time, uh, as you remember, we have been talking about uh, mainly horizontal fragmentation uh, and specifically about uh, primary horizontal fragmentation and uh, derived horizontal fragmentation. We have seen different uh, correctness measures like uh, completeness, uh, reconstruction, and disjointness. And also, we have seen how to you know, compute for ver uh, horizontal fragments, uh, both in case of uh, uh, primary horizontal fragments and uh, derived uh, horizontal fragmentation or fragments. Uh, besides that, we have seen different uh, algorithms, among which common algorithm that yields uh, complete and minimal uh, list of uh, predicates, uh, simple predicates and minimal predicates is calculated uh, or is seen. In our today's session, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, mainly vertical fragmentation uh, as one of uh, the uh, database partitioning techniques. And uh, besides uh, vertical fragmentation, we will be looking at uh, allocation or uh, distribution and uh, a combined, combined approach. Um, so vertical fragmentation has been studied within uh, the centralized context because, uh, you know, in distributed context, uh, vertical fragmentation is a little bit harder than uh, horizontal fragmentation due to multiple reasons. Uh, for instance, in vertical fragmentation, we are not going to fragment uh, relations based on uh, tuples value uh, or not horizontal, it's vertical. So for that purpose, we might compromise the referential integrity of uh, relations while splitting them uh, into different sub-relations. So columns might have uh, a strong relation with uh, um, other columns in the same relation. So we have to you know, consider the relationship among these columns or attributes while splitting them to or transforming some to a sub relation. So due to this fact, uh, vertical fragmentation is uh, among the most complex uh, fragmentation uh, techniques we have at hand. There are two types of uh, vertical fragmentation. The first one is grouping and the second one is splitting. When we come to grouping, it's about uh, categorizing uh, or making groups of uh, attributes. So those, those attributes uh, will have uh, similar characteristics. For instance, if we take uh, 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 a relation called customer orders, then uh, information regarding the customer uh, personal information, or it could be contact information, could be categorized as one group, and information regarding uh, orders could be uh, categorized in a separate group. But when you come to splitting, uh, splitting is a little bit different because we are here starting from relations and splitting um, columns, set of columns into different uh, sub-relations. In the first one, when you come to grouping, grouping is overlapping technique and splitting is non-overlapping technique. That means uh, in case of grouping, you might have uh, some columns which exist in uh, all or some of the uh, fragments. Or sub relations, but when you come to splitting, it's non, -over non overlapping fragment. That means uh, there is no way to have um, an attribute exist in more than one uh, fragment in case of this one. But uh, specifically, like repl replicated key attributes uh, might not be considered or will not be considered as uh, overlapping, join attributes will not be considered as overlapping. So when we come to overlapping fragments, uh, the advantage here is, uh, as we already discussed before, it's easier to enforce functional dependencies or like uh, referential integrity and other um, integrity uh, constraints uh, because we can have multiple uh, columns shared among different fragments. So the information requirements for uh, inf uh, vertical fragmentation uh, are, for instance, from the application uh, information perspective, we have attribute affinities. When we say attribute affinities, it is simply a measure that indicates how closely related uh, the attributes are. Um, so basically, we will have uh, like A1 up to AN uh, attributes in a given relation R. So a way to calculate uh, the cohesiveness or uh, you know the similarity uh, between 
the closeness between uh, attributes can be calculated using attribute affinities. But uh, attribute affinities is mainly obtained from uh, uh, primitive usage data. That means uh, it's uh, simply calculated from the uh, frequency of usage or uh, the usage value of uh, that attribute by a list of queries uh, generally. So to formalize our definition, attribute usage values, which is a primitive input for uh, attribute affinity, is also another uh, application information that we might need for vertical fragmentation. So to formalize attribute usage values, uh, let's say we have a set of queries Q, which is constituted of Q1 up to Q, Q, and uh, it will run uh, on, the assumption is that it will run on relation R that uh, has um, attributes A1 up to AN. Attribute usage matrix of uh, um, the queries Q can be calculated as uh, the following. So the usage of uh, QI on uh, attribute AJ is calculated or computed as 1 if attribute e AJ is referenced by query I. Otherwise, it will be uh, put as uh, 0. So basically, uh, whenever a query access uh, some uh, attribute AJ, then uh, the corresponding use value is uh, uh, calculated as 1 but otherwise it will be zero. So uh, this equation produces uh, an uh, attribute uh, usage matrix in general. Let's take this example to calculate, to know how to calculate you know, attribute usage uh, matrix or att attribute usage in general. Let's consider these four applications or four queries. The first one uh, accesses or projects budgets from uh, uh, um, a relation called proj uh, by a condition project number is equal to value and the other also does the same like select project name budget from project is done by query 2 query 3 performs uh, a selection of uh, or projection of project name by a selection criteria allocation is equal to value from a relation proj the last query uh, is kind of aggregate one it uh, projects a uh, the aggregate sum of uh, attribute budget from uh, relation proj by using a selection condition or criteria allocation is equal to value. So when we see um, the first query, for instance, the first query accesses uh, attributes like budget and project number because the first part it's uh, projecting attribute budget and the second part it's uh, using project number to formulate its uh, selection criteria. So we can calculate the same for all. For instance, query two accesses project name, budget uh, attributes. Query three accesses project name and location. And query four accesses budget and location. So the attribute usage matrix can be calculated uh, or uh, rendered as follows. In the row wise, you can uh, list uh, uh, all number of queries that are accessing any of these attributes here. But uh, in the column wise, you can list uh, Attribute. So the intersection uh, defines the usage values. So if query one is accessing project number, then the corresponding value here in the matrix will be one because we have seen it here in the use QIAJ equation. Uh, if query one is ac uh, accesses P name, project name attribute, then the corresponding value will be one. But in our case, uh, query one does not access attribute project name. So the same is true, true for all. So this is how you construct uh, attribute usage uh, matrix in general by using a formula that we have seen a couple of minutes ago here. Then after getting the attribute uh, usage matrix here, the next step would be to calculate the uh, affinity measure. So when we say affinity measure, it's a, a measure of closeness between two attributes. So the affinity measure between attributes uh, AI and AJ, for instance, uh, of relation R, uh, with respect to set of applications Q, is defined as as follows. Look, when we calculate the affinity measure, we are considering a list of uh, uh, attributes, a couple of attributes. Uh, for instance, in our case, we are taking uh, AI and uh, AJ, whereas uh, I and J are uh, iterative variables here. And these attributes belong to relation R, and uh, the attribute affinity measure 
of uh, this attribute in relation R is calculated with respect to the set of applications or queries Q. So the attribute, uh, the affinity measure of AI AJ is calculated as uh, for all queries um, that access AI and AJ. Uh, it's as a summation of uh, query access. So basically, uh, affinity uh, measure of AI and AJ is uh, sum of query access uh, of all queries that access AI and AJ. But when we further expand the uh, query access uh, equation, so query access uh, in turn is uh, the sum of access frequency of a query times access over execution uh, of that same query on all sides, on all sides. Okay, so we have affinity uh, measure, which is calculated as uh, uh, the sum of query access for all queries that access AI and AJ. And the query access is further computed as uh, the sum of the product of access frequency of a query and uh, access over execution for all sites in a given distributed environment. So assume uh, each query in the previous example accesses attributes once during each execution. Each execution. That means uh, in the previous query, in this query, list of queries, then uh, each query is assume each query is accessing um, uh, attributes once per uh, execution. This is simply uh, to, you know, to make this calculation easy. For instance, if if we say um, our assumption is that each execution. Um, yields uh, access for an attribute then it's like one access over one execution so the result for this one in all cases will be one so just to, to simplify things you know so that we can understand the overall or the big picture of this vertical fragmentation and specifically affinity measure so the first assumption is as we said uh, uh, all attributes are accessed once uh, during each execution so it's like uh, one over one for this calculation here Okay, uh, and also uh, these are given values. Access frequencies are here. When we say access frequencies, these are simply the access frequency of uh, each query per site. Okay, for instance, here it's given, you know, but generally you get this information from database log files or uh, users that are using, uh, that have been using this uh, database for some time. So, Example, query one here uh, has access frequency of 15 on site one. Again, query one has uh, access frequency of 20 on site two and access frequency of 10 on site three. The same is true for all. When you come to the second matrix, it's a matrix that we have uh, calculated in our previous example. It's a usage matrix. So the matrix is constructed from a list of queries and a list of attributes. So now we have uh, three important uh, values the first one is access frequency matrix to the middle left side here the second one is uh, uh, a usage matrix uh, attribute usage matrix to the right side and the other assumption is that access over execution is one so given this uh, to calculate the affinity of for instance uh, the attribute a1 and a3 in our case attribute a1 is project number and attribute a3 is budget so to calculate the affinity or the closeness uh, between attribute A1 and S3, we simply do uh, uh, we simply compute the uh, access frequency of uh, queries or queries that are that access both attributes A1 and S3. For instance, from our uh, usage matrix, attribute A1, as we said, is project number attribute A3 is budget. So we have to list all queries first, you know, that access both attributes. So query one, for instance, access both project number here and uh, budget. Okay, so now we have query one, but there is no other query that accesses both of these attributes. So for that purpose, uh, the computation is going to be easy because we are only going to consider uh, query one. So here, affinity uh, of A1 and A3 is calculated as the access frequency of Q1 on all sites. Okay, the access frequency of Q1 
um, on all sides, or specifically, it's calculated as the ax, the, the product of access frequency of uh, QD1 times access over execution, in our case it's 1, for all sides. So here we have three sides uh, in our example. So simply affinity of A1 and S3 is calculated as the product of access frequency of Q1 times 1 for all sides S1, S2, and S3. So the access frequency of QD1 on site 1 is 15 times, times, then access over execution for QD1 is 1 because it's given here in the first statement, plus this is uh, the second iteration. This iteration is uh, depicted here, QD access here. Okay? Then the access frequency of QD1 on site 2, because we said in the previous example for all sites, so we have to iterate over sites. So the access frequency of uh, QD1 on site 2 is 20, plus the access frequency of QD1 on site 3 is 10. So simply we do uh, the access frequency times access of execution for all sites. So the result of affinity of A1 with A3 is uh, 46. Okay. So basically, uh, when we proceed with computing for affinity uh, measure of uh, two attributes in this set, in this set like uh, project number, project name, budget, and location, the following uh, affinity um, matrix will be generated. For instance, to add one more, for instance, to add one more. Let's compute for uh, the affinity between uh, uh, project name and budget. So here we have project name, uh, project name. Uh, here we have budget. So to know how we come up with this result, for instance, first let's start by uh, identifying queries that are accessing both project name and budget. In our case, project name could be referred to us as A1 and budget could be referred to us as A2. So the affinity between A1 and A2 is calculated as uh, first by, by first uh, identifying queries that are accessing both of these attributes. In our case, uh, uh, the queries that are accessing both of these attributes uh, are query 2 only, actually. Only query 2. Because for both, we have uh, uh, use matrix value of 1. So the affinity of uh, A1, uh, sorry, A2, in our case, P name is A2, right? So the affinity, matrix, the affinity value or the affinity measure uh, between A2 and A3, which is project name and budget, is calculated as the sum of uh, product of uh, the access frequency of QD2 times access over execution for all sites QD2 is being applied. So in our case, for the first case, for instance, uh, affinity of A2 and A3 uh, for, is calculated only for QD2. So uh, the access frequency for query 2 on uh, site, site 1 is 5, so we calculate it as 5 times access over execution, which is 1, okay, 5 times 1, plus on site 2, 0 times 1, on site 3, 0 times 1. In both cases, the value will be 0, but in the first case, the value is 5. So this is how the... Uh, affinity measure of uh, project name and budget or A2 and A3 is uh, computed. You can do the same for uh, the remaining attributes, okay? Once we have this uh, attribute uh, affinity measure matrix or affinity measure matrix in general, the remaining task will be to cluster attributes based on their uh, affinity value. Generally speaking, uh, attributes that have a larger affinity measure value are, are assumed to be close enough to be categorized in one fragment or in one vertical fragment. So that's the reason behind you know this calculation of uh, affinity measure. So after constructing the affinity measure matrix, the next step would be to see attributes that have uh, you know larger affinity measure uh, between them and trying to cluster them into one category. Let's talk about the clustering algorithm. 
So let's take uh, the attribute affinity matrix, uh, AA, and uh, reorganize the attribute orders to form clusters where the attributes in each cluster demonstrate high affinity to one another. So here, for instance, uh, we haven't reorganized the uh, attributes order in the uh, right bottom side. The purpose of clustering algorithms is simply, you know, to find a way to, to reorganize these attributes so that they can form uh, different fragments based on the value of their uh, affinity measure. So for that, we use uh, an algorithm, a very you know, well-known algorithm called uh, bond energy algorithm. And uh, it has been used for clustering of uh, entities in various scenarios. For instance, in our case, when we say entities, the entities are attributes. But in other domain of problem, even bond energy has been used for uh, various domains like chemistry, physics, uh, any domain that needs clustering have been using uh, bond energy. So uh, bond energy algorithm finds an ordering of entities uh, such that the global affinity measure is uh, maximized. So here we are going to calculate the global affinity measure uh, uh, in general for each uh, ordering of attributes and the one with a good global affinity measure will be taken and uh, based on that our attributes will be reorganized. So let's further uh, formalize our bond energy algorithm. So the bond energy algorithm takes our uh, attribute affinity matrix and the, the, the expected outcome or output is the clustered affinity matrix which is you know a perturbation of uh, our attribute affinity matrix. There is no new value to be added here, but uh, the ordering of the columns will be changed by the end of, might be changed by the end of this bond energy algorithm operation. So we initialize uh, our uh, cluster affinity matrix uh, uh, in general by placing and uh, fixing one of the columns of attribute affinity uh, matrix uh, in the uh, cluster uh, affinity matrix. Uh, and then by iteration, we are going to place the remaining n minus one columns in the remaining i plus one positions in the uh, you know uh, cluster affinity matrix. And for each column, we choose the placement that makes the most contribution to the global affinity measure. For instance, in our case, we might start uh, here. For instance, here in the uh, bottom right corner, we might start by placing project number first in our cluster affinity matrix, uh, and uh, we gradually start adding other columns so that we can calculate uh, the contribution of placing project number in the first place okay so for instance for the first one project number is a1 so we might place project name a1 then project name is a2 and we assume that there is another project uh, another uh, attribute uh, like uh, a0 so we start computing the contribution of this ordering, like A0, A1, and uh, A2, for the overall uh, global affinity measure. If, you know, after this, we, may, we will get uh, one uh, value. We, I will show you how to compute this one in a second. But uh, again, we will try to place, like here, for instance, project number is placed here. We might place project number next to project name and compute for uh, the global affinity measure of this matrix. Then by comparing the outcomes of uh, you know, placing this project number in all possible slots in this affinity measure or cluster affinity matrix, then uh, the one of the ordering that has a larger affinity measure, the larger global affinity measure will be taken to uh, identify the right place to put the column. Let's see this one uh, in detail. So let's say uh, we have three attributes. So the contribution of placing AI, then AK, then AJ in a given cluster affinity uh, matrix is calculated as two times bond energy of AI and AK plus two times bond energy of AK and uh, AJ minus two times bond uh, of uh, AI and AJ. Here, first we are calculating uh, the uh, bond energy between AI and AK. Then we are calculating uh, the bond energy between AK and AJ. We are summing up the result of both. And uh, we are uh, you know, deducting the uh, value or the outcome of computing the bond energy between AI and AJ from uh, the previous uh, result. This yields 
the value for the contribution of this ordering in general. Okay, but further, uh, this bond energy equation further can be expanded as the following. The bond energy between x and ay, any attribute x and y, can be computed as uh, the sum of uh, product of affinity measure of AZAX and affinity measure of AZAY for all Z uh, from 1 to N where N is the number of attributes in a given uh, matrix okay so now we have contribution of AI AK AJ it can be calculated as uh, the sum and uh, difference uh, among uh, different bond energy uh, values but each bond energy is calculated as uh, the, the sum of product of uh, affinity measures between uh, uh, the two columns in a given uh, bond energy calculation, but uh, with their neighbors, uh, their, 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 uh, their uh, affinities co computed with their neighbors. For instance, let's take uh, AX is uh, A1 and AY is uh, A2. So affinity, the bond energy between A1 and A2 can be calculated as the sum of product of uh, affinity measure between for the first iteration for instance z will be one so a1 with a1 times affinity measure between a1 and a2 for instance then this will be iterated then for the second iteration z will be two so affinity measure between a2 and a1 times affinity measure between a2 and a2 again for the third one we have four columns right so for the third one, for the third attribute, Z, for third iteration, Z will be 1. So affinity measure between, uh, Z will be 3, I'm sorry. So affinity measure between AZ and a AX is calculated as uh, A3 and A1 times affinity measure between A3 and A2 because uh, AY is A2 or it's a, um, I think, project name. So again, th the same is true for the fourth iteration n will be 4 for the final iteration so affinity measure between az and ax is calculated as affinity measure between a4 and a1 times affinity measure between a4 and a2 so this the sum of this product uh, will give us you know the overall uh, bond energy between ax and ay so computing this result further by using the uh, corresponding uh, equations uh, of uh, contribution of contribution formula or equation will give us uh, the global you know contribution of uh, one ordering in general so let's uh, let's uh, discuss this one by example consider the following affinity attribute affinity matrix and the corresponding cluster affinity matrix so in this case, for instance, we have placed the project number and project name in our cluster affinity uh, matrix uh, initially. So we have to initialize the cluster affinity matrix with uh, some sort of columns or attributes. So let's uh, use this uh, initial placement and calculate the ordering between uh, among uh, uh, project number, project name, project number and project name, and other other columns. For instance, in the first case, we are uh, uh, here trying to calculate the ordering the contribution of ordering of uh, attribute 0 attribute 3 and attribute 1 in our case for instance attribute 1 is project number attribute 3 is budget and attribute 0 is some you know placeholder uh, assume we are assuming simply that uh, there is one unknown column before uh, project number so in order to calculate the contribution of ordering attribute 0 then attribute 3 then attribute 1 we are simply going to uh, place uh, the corresponding names of uh, the attributes in our contribution equation. So here, uh, attribute zero is attribute zero because we do not know uh, what the attribute zero is, but we know attribute three, uh, which is budget, and attribute uh, one is project number. So the contribution of ordering uh, attribute zero, budget, and uh, project number in the following, in this manner, is calculated as two times bond energy between A0 and budget plus two times bond energy between budget and project number minus two times bond energy between A0 and project number. This simply comes from the previous equation. 
contribution of AI AK AJ can be calculated as two times bond energy of AI and AK plus two times bond energy of AK and AI minus two times bond energy of AI and AJ. So if you go there, you can see this formula clearly. Okay. So uh, two times uh, bond energy of A0 and budget plus two times bond energy of budget and project number minus two times bond energy of uh, A0 and project number. So further, uh, bond energy between A0 and budget is simply calculated as uh, written uh, here. So the bond energy between any two attributes AX and AY is calculated as the sum of product of affinity measure between AZ and AX and affinity measure between AZ and AY uh, for Z from 1 to N, where N is the number of uh, attributes in a given relation which are subject to this uh, fragmentation. So if we take uh, the bond energy between A0 and budget, uh, so if you substitute these two, A0 and budget, to our previous uh, example, for instance, the affinity measure between uh, any, any attribute and A0 is going to be 0 because A0 is not part of our initial or uh, our initial attribute affinity matrix or even it's not part of the original relation. So for that purpose, the affinity measure between any uh, attribute and uh, the attribute A0, which is imaginary one, is going to be 0. So in the first case, the result of this bond energy calculation is going to be zero. Again, for the third case, two times bond energy between A0 and project number, the result is going to be zero because uh, project the affinity between uh, project number and uh, attribute A0 is always zero. So even though you are going to iterate multiple times, at least four times because of the, the size of uh, the variable Z, uh, the Ultimately, the result is going to be zero. So here we have zero. Again, in the third uh, component of the equation, we have zero. So the only equation that we are going to compute now is uh, uh, the middle one, which is two times bond energy between budget and uh, project number. So here we are going to iteratively uh, uh, compute the product of budget and each attribute in, a, in the affinity measure matrix. And again, the product of project number with each attribute in the product in the uh, attribute affinity matrix. So two times bond energy uh, between uh, budget and the project number is calculated as uh, the affinity measure between budget and uh, A1. A1 is project number times times because for the first round Z is going to be uh, one. So we're now we are doing the first iteration with z is equal to 1. So 2 times bond energy between budget and project number for the first round, for instance, is going to be uh, affinity made the product of affinity measure between uh, budget and project number times the product of affinity measure between project number and uh, project number, right? Because z is 1. So the intermediate result of this one will be summed up with the second iteration result. And the second iteration, uh, Z is going to be one. So the bond energy between this for the second iteration is going to be calculated as affinity measure between budget and Z is equal to two, right? Second iteration is Z two. So Z two uh, in our case two is project num name. So the affinity measure between budget and project name times the affinity measure between uh, project number and project name then the result of this will be again summed up to the previous uh, result for the iteration one. Then now we come to the third iteration. For the third iteration, Z is going to be three. So this three means budget, right? So it's a third attribute here. So the, the calculation goes like this. The affinity measure between uh, budget and uh, budget times affinity measure between project number and budget because budget is uh, the third column z at this stage is three so the product of these two will be added to the previous uh, uh, intermediate result will be accumulated there then for the last iteration for the fourth iteration z is going to be four so the attribute affinity between or uh, the, the bond energy between budget and project number at the fourth iteration is calculated as affinity measure between uh, attribute four and budget times attribute affinity between 
um, attribute for and project number. In our case, attribute for is location, so it will be calculated as the product of the affinity measure between budget and location, and uh, um, uh, the affinity measure between project number and uh, location. So ultimately, the result will be uh, you know 8,820. You can calculate this one uh, uh, by yourself, but uh, this is how you how you compute the ordering with uh, you know larger contribution is supposed to be the best uh, ordering so that we can use it to reorder the columns uh, in a given cluster uh, affinity matrix. So the result uh, looks like this one. For instance, let's go back to the previous affinity measure uh, matrix. For instance, here in the affinity measure matrix, the attributes with, uh, you know, larger number of affinity are, at, for instance, attributes, project number in budget has uh, affinity measure of 45, which is good. It they, So that they are subject to, you know, being in one fragment. Again, for instance, uh, location and project name, the two attributes have also uh, larger affinity measure. So again, project name and location have high degree of being, you know, in the same fragment. Um, uh, again, budget and project name, uh, they have some value, right? So five, so they, are, they also could be considered for fragmentation, to be fragmented in the same uh, subrelation. Again, um, you know, location and uh, budget have uh, affinity measure of three. They are also subject to uh, fragmentation. But from this affinity measure matrix, you can uh, deduct that, you know, project name and project uh, number might not be the right candidates to be in the same uh, fragment because their uh, corresponding value is zero. Again, uh, you know, even for instance, location and uh, budget, they have, uh, you know, uh, smaller uh, affinity measure. So they might not be subject to being uh, in one fragment, but for sure from this affinity measure matrix, project name and uh, location are going to be in the same fragment. And um, again, budget and uh, project number might be in the same category, but the the decision is for uh, the, uh, you know, the cluster affinity matrix or for the formula specifically contribution uh, formula or or uh, the global affinity matrix calculation formula, which is uh, the contribution formula. Okay, uh, so finally here, for instance, in the last uh, row of the slide, you see uh, the final result after computing the contribution of ordering all these uh, attributes in all possible slots, in all possible slots. So in this case, for instance, uh, uh, project number and budget are adjacent here because of their affinity measure. Uh, again, uh, budget and project name are adjacent, project name and location are adjacent. Okay. Once we have, uh, once we have, uh, you know, the cluster affinity matrix, then uh, the cluster affinity matrix gives us the right ordering of uh, attributes. Okay. Then the the last step in cluster affinity matrix would be to reorder the rows according to the uh, columns or the uh, attributes ordering in the vertical side. Okay, for instance, project number here is the first one. Okay, budget is the second one. So we have to reorder this one, this one to this one. Okay, for instance, in the first uh, cluster affinity matrix, budget was the third one row wise. So we have to reorder it like budget in the column wise is uh, second in the second slot so it has to be in the second row uh, row wise uh, project name in the third slot so the same should be true for row wise and the same is also uh, true for location or uh, the fourth attribute so from from this you can you know roughly uh, proceed on you know categorizing or clustering or fragmenting this relation in general for instance, the one with a large number of uh, affinity uh, value can be categorized into one fragment. The other, like, like here in the uh, bottom right corner, can be categorized into one fragment. The one in the left top, the top left, can be categorized into another one. Okay, simply. So like project number, number and budget uh, have large affinity measures, so we can categorize them into one. 
project name uh, and uh, location also have a large number of uh, affinity uh, measures so we can categorize them into one group let's talk about uh, clustering them based on the cluster affinity uh, matrix so the question is how can you divide a set of cluster attributes like uh, a1 up to an into uh, two or more sets of uh, attributes you know because or fragments um, like for instance for uh, attributes for set of attributes a1 up to an you may um, fragment them into two like a1 up to ai and uh, from ai up to an where n is the maximum number of uh, attributes in a given relation so we compute this one from our cluster uh, affinity matrix okay so the goal for virtual ver uh, vertical fragmentation algorithm is that uh, to come up with the right fragments adherence uh, to the principles of uh, minimality and uh, completeness okay so for instance here we have uh, one fragment ta and the other fragment pa so the question is how can we come up with such kind of uh, fragmentation or classification or partitioning given uh, this kind of cluster affinity matrix So let's formalize uh, the uh, vertical fragmentation algorithm. Uh, let's first uh, define a set of uh, uh, operands. The first one is TQ. TQ is considered a set of applications that access only TA. BQ is a set of applications that access only BA. And OQ is a set of applications that access both. Okay. Then uh, uh, CTQ is a total number of accesses to attributes by applications that access only TA. Okay, uh, CBQ is the true for uh, uh, fragment BA. COQ is total number of accesses to attributes by applications that access both TA and BA. Uh, the, the point is to find the point along the diagonal that maximizes CTQ times CBQ minus COQ square. Or if number of queries that accesses both queries, both attributes are larger than number of uh, queries that accesses these two separately then the fragmentation is not recommended in general so basically vert vertical fragmentation performs its fragmentation by calculating um, a point where the queries accessing one fragment or each fragment or the product of queries, ac queries accessing each fragment uh, is greater than uh, the square of uh, queries that accesses both of these uh, attributes. So this is uh, basically uh, calculated as CTQ times CBQ minus COQ square. So the one with uh, larger uh, value uh, will be uh, the candidate for splitting or partitioning your relation. So uh, we can consider uh, two problems. For instance, in the first case, we can consider cluster forming a cluster in the middle in the middle of uh, cluster affinity matrix. Okay, uh, we can simply start from uh, the middle, as you can see here, and uh, then uh, shift a row up and uh, a column and left, like uh, this one. Shift a row up and a column and left. So in each iteration, we are going to shift up left, then up left. So we are diagonally. We are uh, going to narrow the topper fragments so that in a way we calculate the the good split or the best split that uh, uh, divides your relation in adher adherence or in uh, conformance to the principles of uh, vertical fragmentation correctness the cost or the big o uh, of uh, the complexity of this operation is going to be om square but in the second problem category, we are going to have M way of partitioning this. So try to split uh, the relation into uh, M minus one split points along the diagonal and try to find the best point of each of uh, these splits. Okay, so again, we are going to calculate for uh, the good result after computing for CTQ times CBQ minus COQ square. So since uh, there are a number of uh, partitions or there are more than two uh, partitions so the uh, 
worst case uh, complexity of this algorithm is uh, of 2 raised to m. So the correctness of vertical fragmentation uh, uh, can be calculated as follows. A relation R defined over attribute set A and key K, because uh, we are talking about overlapping vertical fragmentation, we have been talking about that one since uh, we started this presentation. So this one, like R, relation R, the original relation R, that's defined over a set of attributes A and key that helps to keep the referential integrity among fragments generates the vertical partitioning FR, which is constituted of uh, R number of fragments. Then the completeness of uh, vertical fragment can be uh, calculated if, or can be asserted if, uh, the union of all uh, vertical fragments yields the original uh, set of attributes A. Okay, so that's uh, the criteria for completeness. For construction, if we successfully join all the vertical fragments by using you know the key attribute as a join condition as a join attribute for all fragments in a set of fragments and if the result yields the original relation r then uh, we assert the reconstructability of the vertical fragments for uh, disjointness uh, we do not consider table ids or joint uh, join uh, attributes as overlapping as we have uh, mentioned before so they are not considered to be overlapping so again duplicate keys are not considered to be overlapping but disjointness basically means uh, except table ids that are used for uh, preserving referential integrity and other integrity constraints except duplicate keys which are again keys um, if each fragment does not have uh, additional overlapping elements then uh, we assert the disjointness of the vertical uh, fragments or the mutual exclusivity of uh, the vertical fragments. The other types of fragmentation is uh, hybrid fragmentation. So hybrid fragmentation basically can be uh, described by using this uh, diagram. For instance, here we have a relation R and it's further uh, fragmented uh, by using primary horizontal fragmentation then R1 and R2 will be their, uh, its uh, corresponding value or subrelation. Then we can apply uh, vertical fragmentation on each of these primary horizontal fragments. So further we can get R11, R12, uh, 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 and again for uh, second uh, primary horizontal fragmentation R2, we can get, uh, we can further, you know, uh, apply uh, vertical fragmentations to get uh, vertical fragmentations and get uh, R21, R22, R3 and likewise. So if you are going to apply, for instance, uh, uh, primary horizontal fragmentation first or even drive horizontal fragmentation first, then uh, vertical fragmentation on the intermediate uh, subrelations, that's called hybrid fragmentation and also vice versa. You know, if you project uh, some columns from uh, uh, your relation first, it's called vertical fragmentation, and then if you apply selection operation, like, uh, you know, primary horizontal fragmentation on them, we consider this one as hybrid fragmentation. So reconstruction of uh, hybrid fragmentation is uh, asserted by applying union over join. So we start by joining all fragments uh, by using join operation. First, we have to apply in bottom-up manner, uh, join among between all of this uh, or among all of these uh, vertical fragments. Then the result of these join operations will be uh, put into the operator uh, union, and the resulting operation should yield the original relation R. So if the result of this computation uh, yields original relation R, then we call it, uh, uh, it is reconstructable uh, hybrid fragmentation. Well, so far we have been uh, talking about different uh, fragmentation alternatives. We have seen uh, primary horizontal fragmentation, derived horizontal fragmentation, and uh, vertical fragmentation. We have also seen uh, the different uh, verification mechanisms for uh, those fragmentation techniques, uh, specifically correctness uh, measures like uh, completeness, disjointness, reconstruction, uh, 
as a criteria to assert the correctness of uh, any of those fragmentations. Now, uh, let's talk about allocation uh, in a distributed environment, allocation of fragments in, distri in a distributed environment, which is uh, called data distribution. And right after that, we will be talking about uh, combined approach, which is a combination between fragmentation and data distribution. Just uh, to uh, formalize the problem domain of fragment allocation, uh, we have uh, three uh, major ingredients or inputs for uh, our problem domain. The first one is a set of fragments, uh, and the second one is a set of uh, sites or network sites, and the third one is a set of applications or queries, as F, S, and Q respectively. So the ultimate goal of uh, any fragment allocation is to find the optimal distribution of a set of fragments to a set of sites or network sites. But when we talk about optimality, uh, we have to consider the following uh, matters. Uh, the first one would be minimal cost. So when we talk about optimality or making some allocation optimal, then we are talking about uh, creating an allocation whose ultimate cost is minimum relative to the other possible alternatives of uh, fragment allocation. So this minimal cost is comprised of the sum of communication cost, storage cost, and processing cost. When we say processing cost, it's a read and uh, update cost or read and write cost. Usually the cost uh, for this fragment allocation and as a metrics for uh, or a unit for Optimality is measured in terms of time, but you could also measure in terms of, uh, you know, space in some uh, conditions. The second consideration that you have to take while talking about optimal uh, fragment allocation is performance. You have to consider response time and throughput. In addition to the cost and performance uh, for optimality, uh, there are also constraints that uh, abstain you from achieving the desired goal. So there are different constraints per site, which are, for instance, storage constraints uh, and processing constraints. This should also be considered while calculating the optimal uh, solution for your uh, uh, fragments allocation. So specifically, the information requirements for uh, fragment allocation uh, from the database perspective, the first one would be selectivity of fragments. This helps you to identify whether the fragments are idle or not, or to know the degree of uh, selectivity of fragments. This would help you to you know, uh, identify where to put uh, which fragments. For instance, uh, some fragments with uh, infrequent uh, or less frequent uh, selectivity could be assigned to uh, a computational node or a database node or network site whose uh, computational capability is uh, uh, little relative to the other ones. The other uh, information that we, meet, we may need in, in the database information is the size of uh, a fragment. Uh, this size of fragment helps you to identify where you can put your fragment depending on uh, the size of the fragment and the capacity or the storage capacity of uh, the site. From the application information perspective, uh, the first information that you require to do allocation is access types and uh, numbers. In the first database information, we said selectivity of fragments, which it's kind of general. It shows, uh, you know, uh, uh, generally whether uh, the fragments are being accessed or not. But specifically in the application dimension, you have to know the types of access. Is it read? Is it update? Uh, is the lock exclusive? Is it shared lock? You have to know this one. And the number of accesses should also be known. The other one is access locality. This uh, helps you know whether the uh, number of uh, uh, applications accessing a given data are from local source or from local node or not. This will uh, tell you, you know, if uh, the number of the maximum, the larger number of uh, queries accessing a given fragment are from a remote site, then this might be, you know, a sign for you to reallocate that fragment to another location. So for that purpose, you might need access uh, localities information. Again, communication network information is also required, uh, specifically unit cost of storage and unit cost of processing per site level is required. Computer system informations like bandwidth, communication latency, and overhead are also you know, required to allocate your fragments optimally. So the keyword here in fragment allocation is uh, optimality.
So there are two types of allocations. The first one is file allocation, and the second one is database allocation. When you come to file allocation, it's a, a, a pro, it's a technique to distribute files in its entirety per site level. In file allocation uh, modality, a file is defined as uh, um, some entity whose relationship is contained in one uh, uh, site. So for that purpose, file allocation is a relatively uh, uh, easier task than database allocation. When you come to database allocation, you have to explicitly preserve the relationship or referential integrities between uh, fragments that are uh, fragmented or split or partitioned over and reallocated over the network. So you have to preserve the relationship between fragments when you uh, try to assign or allocate databases in a distributed mm -hmm. environment. But in case of file allocation, there is no such kind of thing. Uh, so in case of uh, database allocation, fragments are not individual files. That means uh, there is a relationship between uh, fragments, even though if they are uh, over the network. In case of uh, file allocation, um, files are distributed over the network, and there is no need to worry about uh, establishing relationship between files because every file uh, with all of its relationships, internal relationship, relationships, or with its entirety is stored in a single site. So for that purpose, uh, an application requiring file one uh, might not have to uh, scrap or crawl for other uh, files which are located in a distributed environment. If it is written to access one file, then it can access that whole file in its entirety in a single site, and uh, that would make file management tasks easy. Uh, on the other hand, access to database is uh, more complicated in case of database allocation. Uh, so remote file access cannot be applied for database allocation. So for that purpose, relationship between allocation and query processing should be uh, preserved while uh, accessing uh, databases in a distributed environment. Then uh, the other one would be, uh, again, it's similar to the access to database uh, uh, requirement. Cost of integrity enforcement should be considered. Cost of concurrency control should be considered. In case of file allocation, you may not have to worry about concurrency control that much, but in case of database allocation, you, you have to worry about concurrency control because files or uh, fragments uh, distributed over the network uh, might have relationship among them. So generally speaking, file allocation and database allocation, uh, generally they are NP complete problems. So they are very hard problems, but uh, in relation to, uh, in comparison with uh, database allocation, file allocation is uh, uh, simpler, simpler. So uh, to formalize the equation for allocation model, it's generally expressed as the minimum of total cost. But this total cost is subject to response time constraints, storage constraints, and processing uh, constraints. In addition to this one, we have to uh, consider a variable, which is called decision variable, in order to determine whether we have to calculate the cost of uh, a fragment allocation or not per site level. For instance, this decision variable is called xij, and xij is set to 1 if uh, fi, a fragment fi, is assigned to uh, a site sj. So if a fragment fi is not assigned to sj, so there is no need to calculate the allocation of fragment fi at site sj, so there is no need to calculate the cost of fi at sj. So in this case, the value will be zero. So whenever you calculate the cost of uh, allocation model, or if the cost of fragment, allocating fragment over uh, uh, a network, over a network site, you have to uh, include the decision variable. So for every fragment that is not placed in uh, any site, in the, in the set of sites, the uh, corresponding cost will be zero because xij will be zero and uh, uh, the product of anything with xij will be zero. But if a fragment is assigned at a specific site sj, which is part of or element of uh, a set of sites s, then uh, the corresponding value will be calculated since uh, xij will be one. Uh, the total cost can be further uh, defined as uh, for all queries, uh, it's a summation of a query processing cost, and for all sites and uh, all fragments, the summation of uh, it's uh, for all sites and uh, all fragments, it's a summation of cost of storing a fragment at a site. So here you are going to calculate for every query, you have to calculate query processing cost. Then uh, per query level, you have to uh, 
you know, calculate the cost of storing a fragment at site. So for each fragment, uh, you have to calculate first uh, the cost of uh, storing each fragment uh, at each site, and the summation of all these will give us the total cost. So the storage cost or uh, of uh, fragment FG at SK uh, can further be uh, defined as uh, the product of unit storage cost at site K uh, and uh, size of FJ, which is the fragment, a specific fragment, uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, decision variable. So we started with uh, the total cost. The total cost, we define total cost as, uh, uh, for all queries, the summation of query, query processing cost and for all fragments and all sites, uh, cost of storing a fragment as a site, at a site. Uh, and further, when we expand the storage cost here in the second row, storage cost of uh, FJ at SK can be calculated as unit storage cost at SK times size of FJ times uh, decision variable XJK. And query processing cost here, the above one, uh, can be further calculated as um, the processing component plus transmission component. When we further expand the processing component, it's uh, access cost plus integrity enforcement cost plus concurrency cost, uh, concurrency control cost. And uh, when we further expand uh, access cost, it's uh, for all sites and all fragments, it's a summation of number of update accesses plus number of read uh, accesses times uh, decision variable XIJ times local processing cost at the site. The transmission component cost is further defined or expressed by this formula, cost of processing updates plus cost of processing retrievals, okay? And cost of updates is further uh, defined as for all sites and fragments, it's the summation of uh, update message cost plus for all sites and fragments, uh, the summation of acknowledgement uh, cost. The retrieval cost further is uh, uh, defined as uh, for all fragments, uh, the minimum of uh, uh, cost of retrieval command plus cost of sending back the result for all sites. And the last one, uh, while dealing with allocation, fragment allocation is constraint. So these are the constraints that we have uh, to consider while doing fragment allocation. From the response time perspective, uh, always execution time of query should be less than or equal to the maximum allowable, allowable response time for that query. The storage constraint perspective, uh, per site level, for all fragments, storage requirement of a fragment at that site, uh, the summation of storage requirement of a fragment at that site should be less than or equal to storage capacity of uh, that site. And finally, processing constraint per site level is for all queries, the summation of processing load of a query at that site should be less than or equal to processing capacity of that site. So the solution methods for uh, fragment allocation are uh, twofold. The first one is uh, uh, file allocation, as we have seen before. It's an uh, NP-complete problem, and uh, database allocation is also uh, an NP-complete uh, method. This can, these two can be referred to as uh, solution methods for fragment allocation. But uh, the heuristics based on uh, could be based on uh, one of these, for instance, the single commodity warehouse location, which is usually applied uh, or applicable for uh, file allocation. Uh, this one basically stores uh, um, the, all related fragments or data to a single site. This is among the simplest heuristics-based techniques for fragment allocation, and it's applicable usually for uh, file allocation problems. Knapsack problem, again, it's uh, a, an optimization problem that tries to assign or fit the fragments uh, by considering the capacity of the sack uh, only so simply in this case for instance the fragments uh, basically um, are the sub relations that we create from uh, uh, fragmentation process and uh, the sack here in the knapsack problem context the sack is considered as the site with all of its capacity so the knapsack problem tries to fit fragments considering the storage capacity processing uh, capacity of uh, each site and uh, it does this process uh, in uh, an iterative and uh, you know finally an, in an optimal way branch and bound technique it's also a heuristic based uh, technique for fragment allocation you can also use these techniques for other uh, operations branch and bound technique is an incremental technique that incrementally assigns fragments to uh, various sites and uh, calculates the total cost so that the total uh, the total cost uh, um, 
would give uh, an optimal uh, fragment allocation over the uh, network size. Network flow is also another uh, operation. I recommend you to read this uh, heuristic based fragment allocation techniques, which are also general. You know, we can also use them for other types of uh, problems in the domain of computer science uh, in general. So, uh, as you may suspect, you know, the fragment allocation is an NP uh, complete problem. It's an NP hard problem, then polynomial hard problem. So for that purpose, the solution space is going to be large. So in order to, you know, reduce the solution space, there are, there can be, you know, a, a number of uh, operations that you can apply. The first one is uh, assuming all candidate partitionings are now. So we have to select the best uh, uh, partitioning. Uh, by assumption level, but uh, the other uh, quantifiable uh, measure towards reducing the solution space is ignoring replication at first. Also, we can apply sliding window on fragments in order to reduce the solution space. In this sliding window on uh, fragments technique, you can simply uh, partition your uh, relations and uh, distribute them over the network sites. And by using a sliding window, you may have to shift each side, uh, you may have to shift each fragment to a different side, uh, either in a timely manner or based on some criteria. Okay, this is a sliding window uh, uh, technique for fragment allocation. It might uh, be, you know, fused with uh, other techniques like round robin techniques to uh, slide window on fragments uh, upon some time upon some time interval. We have seen about uh, distribution so far. Uh, finally, we will be looking at the combined approach. That means what we can do by combining fragmentation in the data distribution will be uh, discussed uh, uh, in the next few slides. So uh, we have to partition the data, you know, to, to, to dictate where uh, it is uh, located. So for partitioning this uh, uh, relation or data, we could use either workload agnostic techniques or uh, workload uh, aware techniques. For instance, workload agnostic techniques are not aware of the workload of uh, each side. So these are generic type of uh, algorithms or partitioning techniques. For instance, round robin technique simply, you know, shifts fragments from one side to the other uh, based on some time interval periodically. When you come to hash partitioning, this hash partitioning uses some uh, special function called hash so that uh, the data will be input for this hash function and uh, the corresponding site number or site location will be the output of the hash partitioning uh, uh, function or the hash function. So every time uh, during the hash partitioning session, uh, the hash function receives uh, a fragment and uh, the corresponding outcome for this uh, uh, fragment, input fragment, will be uh, the location of the site that you have to assign your fragment to. So this is also very commonly used type of uh, algorithm, hash uh, function algorithm. So we, are, we use it for workload agnostic uh, fragment allocation purposes. The other one is range partitioning technique, which is more related to uh, horizontal fragmentation. This one mainly based on the value of uh, attributes. So uh, you will uh, classify your uh, uh, rows based on some specific key uh, attribute, then uh, uh, categorical uh, uh, data will be used to, uh, you know, to partition or to split data uh, over the network. So this is basically horizontal fragmentation based uh, uh, allocation. So it's range based partitioning. The other and more advanced technique for uh, partition allocation uh, is workload aware techniques. The most commonly used technique is graph-based uh, approach. We, we have already seen about round-robin uh, partitioning, how it assigns uh, 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 fragments to sites. Simply, it assigns uh, all fragments to all uh, sites over time. But at a time, some fragments uh, or all fragments are distributed over um, the network sites. And after some time interval, uh, there will be shifting or, you know, there, may, there will be uh, sliding window uh, approach so that each uh, site will have a different fragment after every period or uh, after in every cycle. Hash partitioning, again, uh, it's the same approach, but uh, you have to use hash uh, functions to accept fragments as input and uh, generate the corresponding site value or site location so that uh, those fragments uh, uh, will be assigned to those sites.
The other one is range partitioning, for instance, uh, for a varchar uh, attribute, you may, you know, uh, classify your range in the following manner, A to G, H to M, U to Z, and likewise. So uh, each, each partition will be assigned to a separate site. But when you come to workload aware partitioning, schism is one of the, uh, the most uh, popular uh, graph-based techniques that we have been using to partition and, you know, to uh, allocate uh, your fragments. You can also use this schism for replication purposes that we will see in a couple of minutes. So generally, uh, it represents the overall problem domain as a graph. So graph is a combination of uh, vertex and edge where the vertex is an element of uh, tuples in a database, and edge is uh, a representation of a query that accesses two uh, tuples in a database. So each edge, ha each edge has uh, a corresponding weight, counting the number of queries that accesses both tuples. For instance, here in the uh, bottom right side, you see uh, a graph, uh, and it uses a schism technique to generate uh, the, the, the relationship between tuples and uh, the access queries. For instance, uh, these vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 uh, corresponds to tuples, and uh, the edge between each of these uh, uh, vertices are uh, queries and their corresponding access frequency. Okay, for instance, uh, uh, tuple 1 and tuple 2 are accessed uh, one time by a query, query 3 and uh, uh, the tuple 3 and the tuple 2 are accessed again two times and this relationship helps you to identify which where to assign what you know and which 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 fragment to replicate and which fragment not to replicate so what we do here is performing vertex disjoint graph partitioning okay so each vertex is assigned to a separate partition generally for instance here uh, here we have for instance two um, uh, and seven separate vertex 2 is linked to uh, a tuple 7 so we might fragment 2 and 7 here again 2 is uh, again related to uh, tuple 3 and tuple 6 we might have we can have you know uh, a separate segment or fragment uh, holding 2 3 and uh, 6 tuples uh, the same is true for the other one so we use uh, disjoint graph partitioning and uh, each vertex will be assigned to a separate partition. Let's uh, dive more into this one. Let's look at this one. For instance, even for the replication uh, purpose, you may uh, use schism, schism technique. So uh, the principle here is that uh, replicate each vertex based on the number of transactions uh, accessing that tuple so, uh, so that each transaction would ask, access uh, a separate copy. For instance, from this graph, we can generate this uh, fragmentation in the partitions. For instance, in this case, um, the first fragment would be uh, 2 and 7. This is mainly based on the vertex 2, which is connected with uh, multiple other vertexes or tuples. So again, 2 is connected to 3 and 6. This will be the second vertex, so that's the second fragment. 2 again with uh, 1 and 3. This will be the third vertex. Uh, uh, this is a third vertex uh, from the perspective of two, so we can have third fragment here, and the same is true for uh, three and uh, you know here four we have a different one. Also, in terms of uh, from from the replication perspective, we can also replicate vertices which are being shared by uh, multiple uh, queries or which have a strong link with uh, uh, different uh, tuples at a time so that uh, the number of transactions, the more number of transactions, then uh, the better you uh, replicate the, the uh, fragments or the, the tuples into a separate fragment, a separate fragment, but replicated fragment. So uh, as you can see here, we have been dealing with tuples. So each vertex is, uh, each vertex corresponds to tuples. So that might be hard for computation because um, an ordinary table might have millions of tuples, so you cannot compute millions of vertexes uh, uh, graph. So for that purpose, it's better to apply some uh, uh, techniques to deal with the graph size. The first approach would be the SWORD uh, approach, approach, so that you can use or you can condense some of the uh, vertices into one vertex. 
based on the commonality between queries. For instance, curiously, curiously accesses vertices one and two and three, four and five. So you can, you know, uh, condense this one uh, as a hypergraph so that when you enter into a vertex one and two, you can separately get the two uh, tuples. But in general, you can represent uh, each vertex as a, as a summarized uh, or as an aggregate of uh, multiple tuples of vertices. The same is true here, for instance, query 1 and query 2 accesses uh, both query uh, tuple 1 and tuple 2 and uh, tuple 6 and tuple 7, so you can condense them or you can summarize them like this. 